Chapter 17 I woke up feeling the most delicious soreness between my legs and an ache in muscles that haven't been used in years. Stretching out, I reach over expecting to find Axel's warm body next to mine, but only meet cold sheets. I open my eyes and look around the room, empty. Climbing out, I pick up the shirt from last night, pull on a pair of yoga pants from my bag and continue my search for Axel. The bathroom is empty, and so is every room I check after. Not in the kitchen, not in the garage, but his truck is still out front. I'm standing on the back porch, looking off across the lake at the sun just barely peeking over the tips of the trees. The lake is calm in the early morning hours, and the world seems to be asleep. I am about to give up my search when I see a slight movement down at the end of the dock. The path to his dock is covered slightly by a line of trees, and in the early morning hours I am worried my eyes might be playing tricks on me. When I see the movement again, I realize I have just found him. Tiny pinpricks shoot through my feet when I hit the cold, pebbled walkway on the way down to the docks. I keep my eyes on his naked back. He is sitting at the very end of the dock. His legs are folded up, and his arms are resting against his knees. It isn't until I get a little closer that I realize his head is resting against his arms, and his back is heaving with deep breaths. He has to have felt my footsteps against the wood of the dock, but if he did, he didn't change his posture. X, I ask softly. No response. Baby, I try again. Nothing. Sighing deeply, I sit down and bring my body close to his. My legs fall open and the cold skin of his back hits my front. He must be frozen. Jesus, Axel, how long have you been out here? Nothing. Axe, baby, please, you're scaring me. What's going on? He's silent for a while. His body jerks slightly, giving away his silence for anything but what it is. My big, strong man is breaking. I knew he was holding his pain tight last night, trying to be strong for me, trying to keep his torment from showing. I bring my arms around and lace my fingers together against his chest, his heart beating rapidly against my arm. His body stills when I place my lips against his back and whisper the only thing I can think of. It's okay, Axe. You can't hold this in. For years I have, and it doesn't help. Then I fall silent and hold him tight, hoping he opens up to me. It's my fault, he finally says, his voice thick with emotion. What? What is? I question. Everything. We fall silent again while I puzzle over his response. We were both victims here in fate's cruel game of keep away. I don't understand how he can even begin to blame himself. Baby, you have to give me more than that. There is no way any of this is your fault, I plead. He straightens his body, but doesn't make the move to turn. Letting his legs fall to dangle from the end of the wooden path, he turns his head and looks over at the sun rising slowly above the tree line. He brings his arms up from their relaxed position at his sides and closes them over mine, before pulling my arms away from his chest and clasping our hands together on his lap. The first thing I did when I left June and Donnie's was report them to child services. Between the conditions they forced us to live in, the food they refused us, and Donnie's creepy behavior with the little girls, there was plenty to shut them down. They lost every child the state was paying for. It's no fucking wonder she slammed the door in my face when I went on my search for you. He let out a humorless laugh before continuing. I wouldn't have even bothered Izzy, but I was fucking desperate to find you. She opened the door. When she saw it was me, the bitch spit in my fucking face. I didn't even get a word out. She did manage to tell me about your parents. I will spare you the details on that, but I got nothing else. She must have loved knowing she had the key to my finding you the key to keeping me from you. When I feel wetness fall on the arm resting on his lap, I lift my cheek from his back and look up at the cloudless sky before realizing it was coming from him. My heart is breaking just a little more from knowing just how deep his agony is rooted. I never got your letters, Izzy. You know, you fucking know I would have come running. Not a single one. I wasn't at base long, I can't give you much, but they scooped me up quick and I had to leave. Top secret shit, and I went dark, baby. I wrote you a letter that explained it all, but the timing of your parents. It makes sense you never got it. I had no fucking clue you were writing, trying to find me. 
He shakes his head as if that simple move can purge the bitterness of his memories. Baby, I don't know what to say. He squeezes my hands and lets me know that he needs this. He needs to get this out. Fucking killing me, Izzy, to know that I was so close to you but so fucking far. Knowing that you and our baby... He pauses on a sob that catches his words. Our baby, God, our baby. That baby would have been the most perfect child ever born. His big body folds over and he starts crying in earnest. Tears of my own are falling down my face and onto his back, but I just hold him tighter. I give him the time he needs to get it out, holding him tight and whispering words of love against his back. We sit there for a while. He lets out his anguish and I hold him, offering what strength I can. The sun is finally up when he sits back up and turns his head. His eyes are red and the tears are still falling silently. Seeing him like this is destroying me. I would have loved that baby. Loved that baby so much, Izzy. We would have been so happy, he says, each word pushing an invisible dagger into my heart. I know it isn't my fault that I miscarried, and I long ago coped with the loss, but right now, in this moment, I feel as if it happened yesterday. I know, Axel, I offer. I wish I knew what to say to help you to ease this pain. He turns his body so that he's sitting completely on the dock before opening his arms. I climb in. All these years I was so mad at you and I held on to that anger so I wouldn't feel the hurt. Fuck me, Izzy. I thought you were happy, that you had moved on without even a second thought. I don't even know how to begin processing this. I don't know how to grieve a child I never knew I almost had. His words are soft above my head, as we sit there looking across the water that is lapping up against the shore. We silently mourn the past that was taken from us without our knowledge. When I lost the baby, I wasn't in a good place, Axel. It took me a while, a long while, before I started to feel human again. At that point, I thought you were gone, Ax. I thought you were lost to me forever. And when I lost that baby, it was like I lost the last part of love we had. I turned to look at him. When I met Brandon, I was vulnerable. I wasn't looking for someone, but he knew how to play the part, and he made me need him. Looking back now, I know I never loved him. I needed the love that I thought he could bring me. I was so alone. I need you to know that I never once stopped loving you, Axel. Please don't take that on your shoulders. He looks at me like he's looking into my soul before placing a soft kiss against my forehead. I know, Izzy. I don't know all the details to your marriage, but I know you, and I believe that. We sit down by the lake with a cold November breeze blowing, and I tell him about meeting Brandon and the early years before the abuse. Axel handles it well, only tensing up a few times. When I start to get to the bad stuff, I can feel the rage building. I gloss over a lot of the bad stuff, but by the end he knows everything. I think he's going to blow a gasket when I tell him about the letter from June. She fucking told you what? He yelled. Uh, she said that you were dead. I don't know why I believed her. I really don't. You have to know that I would never have given up on you and on us. But Axel, she said you were dead, and I had no other way of confirming if it was true or not. It was her way of making me think the worst, and I did. He looks mad. No, not mad. He looks bloodthirsty. I will kill that bitch, he grinds out. His eyes are flashing and his nostrils are flaring with each rapid breath. Seriously, Axe, can we just look forward now? No one wants to see her get hers more than I do, but look where we are. We won. You and I, we are finally back to where we are meant to be. Don't let her win. Please. It takes a while, but he calms down. We sit there in silence while he takes in everything I just told him. I can see all the emotions from anger to resolve cross over his face. I wish I would have tried harder. I keep thinking if I would have approached you when I finally found you that things would be different now. We might have more kids. I would finally have my ring on your finger. It kills me, fucking kills me, he says, 
when I finish explaining everything the last twelve years has brought me. Stop it. I get off his lap and kneel in front of his relaxed form leaning against one of the posts supporting the dock. Taking his face between my hands and leaning in close before I finish, you can't sit here and play what if. It has taken me a long time to realize that what ifs will never change the past, Axel. Right here and right now, you have to promise me that we look forward. No more living with what we could have had. From this day on, we are the new Axel and Izzy. A small smile forms on his face, and some of the sadness leaves his eyes. I lean in and kiss him quickly before releasing his face and sitting back down next to him. Axel and Izzy, huh? That mean you want to be my girlfriend or some shit? He laughs, and it sounds like music to my ears. No, I just want to be yours. That's all I've ever wanted, I answer, reaching over and linking our hands. Princess, you have always been mine. Always. I can promise you to try, but this shit will sit heavy. You have no idea what I want to do to that motherfucker. I know, but can we try? Just try to take each day as a gift it is. I finally have you back, Axel, and for once in a long time, I feel like myself again. Baby, I feel strong. His eyes flare as he pulls me close and plasters a kiss so full of love on my lips that the cold around us has been forgotten. Let's get inside. I'm suddenly starving, he says with a wink. We stand up and walk back into the warmth of his empty house, hand in hand. I slowly shift from the bed for the second time this morning after wearing Izzy out. God damn, crawling back into her tight fucking pussy was like coming home all over again. My dick starts getting hard just thinking about how rough we came together. All the emotions hung thick between us, but knowing that she was finally, fucking finally, my girl again had me feeling like I needed to mark her. I look down at the angel sleeping in my bed and smile. She is passed out, and I doubt an earthquake would wake her at this point. It's been three hours since we climbed back up to the house from our talk at the docks. Three hours of intense lovemaking that had us both screaming over and over. I don't even think there is a drop of cum left in my balls at this point. She sucked me dry, literally a few times. I have to leave this room before the sight of her naked body, every creamy, exposed inch of her skin, has my dick begging for more. More importantly, I need to get this phone call over with before she wakes up. Jogging down the stairs and into the kitchen, I locate my cell on the counter, where I tossed it last night, and walk out the back to place the call. The phone rings a few times before I hear Greg's muffled voice come over the line. What, motherfucker? He says. Nice. Good morning to you too, asshole. It's ten o'clock in the morning. Shouldn't he be doing something productive? Long night? What do you want, Reed? Jesus Christ, are you always a little bitch in the morning? Forget it. I need you to get with Locke and run every fucking thing you can on Izzy's ex. I want the fucking dirt and I want it yesterday. Hear this, G. I want him so fucked that he will feel my dick in his throat. We need to find something that will lock this bastard up for fucking ever. That got his attention. She finally opened up to you, huh? Not a question, but he would get an answer. I know everything, G. No secrets between us now. Once we get this motherfucker put away, I can finally give my girl the future we were meant to have. I might not like that you are so close to my girl, but I am man enough to appreciate everything you have done for her when I couldn't. Yeah, I hear you. Do it. Call Locke, and you two do whatever needs to be done. Keep me posted, but I plan on locking my doors and burying myself deep in my girl for days. Do not fucking bother me unless you have something. I hang up the phone to his laughter before slowly climbing the stairs, falling back into my bed and pulling my girl close. Finally, feeling like my heart can beat again. I can feel the sun warming my skin. I love this blissful state between sleep and just waking. But I no longer relish this moment for being numb. No, now I relish this moment because it reminds me that I am alive. The sun streaming through the big picture windows warms my back. 
and the hard warmth under my cheek is all radiating from Axel. My Axel. I sigh, slowly bring my head off his chest and look into his sleeping face. He looks youthful in his sleep. The hardness that is normally present is wiped clean. All the heavy emotion from yesterday has been erased, and the small smile that teases his lips reminds me of our promise. From this point on, there is no more pain of the past hanging between us. We are once again Axel and Izzy. It's fucking beautiful. Running my eyes down his long, hard body, I notice a tent pitching the sheets that lie loosely on his hips. With a naughty smile, I softly run my hand down his abdomen, enjoying the tensing of his abs as I caress each inch. I check to make sure he is still asleep before I slowly peel the sheet off his body. His thick cock springs up once free of the sheet, standing tall from his body and begging for attention, judging by the small drop of cum oozing from the tip. Jesus, I still can't believe how different his body is. When my hand reaches his neatly trimmed pubic hair, I slide it under his straining skin and cup his warm balls. I roll them softly and test their heaviness, before running my hand up and over the silky skin of his throbbing erection. More pre-cum seeps from the tip and my mouth waters at the sight. Leaning up from where I'm resting next to his side, I bring my body down next to his hips, my legs folded under me and lower my lips down towards his cock. I lick the drop of cum off the tip before placing a soft kiss against his heated skin. He offers a soft moan and stirs slightly but doesn't wake. Wrapping my hand around the tightness of his cock, I notice for the first time just how large he is. Is he even going to fit in my mouth? Licking my lips, I open wide and suck the mushroomed tip into my mouth, swirling my tongue around before releasing and running my tongue from tip to root. He lets out a louder groan, and I see his hand fisting out of the corner of my eye. I continue licking and caressing his throbbing cock a few times before he lets out a loud curse and shifts swiftly, bringing his torso up roughly. The movement jars me enough that I lose my suction, and he falls from my mouth with a loud pop that echoes through the room. His eyes are dark with a desire. The hunger is heavy in the room. Good morning, I offer with a wicked smile. I got hungry. Fuck me, got hungry, huh? Jesus, baby, you're going to kill me. He smiles before he reaches down and pulls me up his body. Love your mouth on my dick, baby, but I love your pussy more. He grips me by the hips and lifts up. He needs no help persuading me to guide him inside my seeping body. I was ready for him the second I opened my eyes. Our lovemaking is hard and quick. Before I know it, we are both crying out in our shared climax. I fall back onto his chest, slick with his perspiration that is sliding against my own. Good morning, princess. He mumbles into my hair. We both laugh and I hold him closer, enjoying this new lightness between us. We cuddle there for a while before he gets up to clean himself off. I smile when he walks back from the bathroom with a washcloth in hand. You do know I know how to clean up myself, right? I joke. My job. I like seeing my cum all over your skin. Mine. This is my job. He continues to wipe me clean before leaning down and giving my sensitive skin a kiss that causes me to moan long and loud. He laughs lightly, falling back next to me in the bed. We might want to get up at some point today, I note, looking over to the window. The sun is hanging high in the sky, letting us know we have missed a good portion of the day. I'm happy right where I am and have no plans of leaving this bed today. Hate to point out the obvious, Axel, but we might want to eat at some point. I look into his smiling eyes before continuing. I mean, I don't know about you, but I plan on enjoying this fine-ass body some more today, and I will need some fuel. His body shakes with silent laughter and I cuddle back down next to his side. Reaching out, I touch the hands of the angel tattooed on his other side. I can't see the body from here, but from what I remember of the tattoo, it was done in almost a loving and peaceful way. Why an angel? I ask. He is silent for a few seconds before answering. Look closer, is all I get. Puzzled by his answer, I crawl over his body and bring my face closer to the tattoo, 
I gasp when I get my first good look at her face. It's me. Holy shit, that's me. Um, I offer lamely. I told you, you are the only person I have ever given my heart to. You have always been the angel in my life, Izzy. You came into my life when I needed you the most, always happy and so full of love for me. Not one day went by that I didn't know how you felt. I got this a few years ago. You might not have been by my side physically, but I couldn't deny you were there mentally. Every day I was gone, it was a memory of you that pushed me. And even when I thought I'd lost you for good, and through that anger, he trails off and I look up into his eyes. Even through the anger of losing you, I still knew you were my angel. My light. Oh my God. I love you, princess. I love you too. I croak and fall into his arms. In that moment, I know that whatever was broken over the years has finally been put back together again. I am whole. Chapter 18 One Month Later Axel and I have been going strong since that weekend we spent locked in his house. It is sometimes shocking for me to think back to the scared and lost girl I was just months ago. He brought out the old me, and I am shining. We have new dreams and plans for our future, and for once, I'm starting to think fate is done with me. I am happy. I am loved. I have overcome. Over the last few weeks, we have spent almost every second together. Axel likes to joke that he's making up for lost time, a joke that often falls short, because it would always remind me of the time we spent apart until he starts taking my clothes off. Our desire for each other is like an itch we can't scratch. We haven't spent a large amount of time with our friends, but we have had a few nights out with them for dinner or drinking. I'm able to do all of my work from Axel's house, and he spends a majority of his time doing his from home as well. The first thing we did when it became obvious that neither one of us wanted to part from the other was buy office furniture. We now both use a large library space as our dual office, his area takes up much more space. Computer monitors and other technical equipment are spread over every surface on his side of the room. I have a small corner, but that is all I need. We work in silence mostly, but we are together, and at this point it is something we both need. Another big purchase we made together was a kitchen table and comfortable couches for the living room. If you didn't know what his house looked like before, you wouldn't be so shocked. But slowly we were turning this large, empty shell of a house he bought into a home for us both. We were back to us for three weeks when he told me I was moving in. There wasn't any room for arguments, and honestly, I wasn't going to put up any. It might seem soon to most, but with all the time we had lost, it made sense for us. We made the pact to move forward, and that's what we are doing, picking up the pieces we had lost and putting them back together continuing with our dreams. Axel has been hinting at marriage, but I'm not sure I'm ready for that yet. Yes, I know it will happen, and I know it will happen with him, but we have only been back together a little over a month. Hell, he has only been in my life for a few months. I feel like we need time. Time for what? I'm not sure. But when the time is right, we will know. He isn't happy about that, I can tell he wants to have me married and pregnant as soon as possible. His argument? We aren't getting any younger, and we both know it will happen, so why wait? It is the only thing between us that doesn't feel settled. It is Saturday morning, and Christmas is just two weeks away. With my move to Axel's, I have missed my daily dose of D. I miss my best friend. I know she is way beyond happy for us and has been busy herself, but it is still an adjustment— going from being dependent on her for my only happiness to seeing her every few days. We have plans to spend the day shopping, visiting Sway, and having dinner with the gang at Heavy's. Axel has some business he needs to take care of in the office, and will be gone most of the day anyway. This is the perfect day to spend with Dee. I have just finished getting dressed when I hear the doorbell echo through the house. I finish zipping my favorite brown leather boots up over my skinny jeans— and with one last check in the mirror, I run through the hall, down the stairs, into the foyer. Throwing open the door with a large smile, I have just enough time to brace myself before Dee is throwing herself in my arms. 
Girlfriend, I have missed you, she sings in my ear. You just saw me the other day, stupid. I laugh and pull away, straightening my cream blouse back into place before looking up into her twinkling brown eyes. My friend is happy as always, but now that I am happy, it is almost like she will burst at any second. Her happiness has hit nuclear levels. You're glowing, Dee, I swear to God. One of these days, all that joy you keep inside you is going to come pouring out like some deranged leprechaun. She laughs before following me through the foyer and around the hallway and into the kitchen. Let me grab my purse and we can get going. What time are our appointments with Sway? I ask, while searching through all the junk on the counter for my phone. I know I threw it down here last night when Axel and I had got home from dinner. He practically attacked me when we walked in the door. Noon. He said we needed to, and I quote, Get our fine little skinny white asses over there with a the quickness so Sway can get all the good gossip about our new man candy. Her impersonation of Sway is disturbing. Okay, okay. Well, Axe is going to be in the office all day. He got a call from Mad early this morning and took off quick. Did Beck say anything about it? I look over at her face, losing its smile slightly before quickly hiding the slip. What was that, Dee? Are you and Beck having issues? She has been dating Beck for a few months now. From what I can tell, that just meant they were having regular sex, because they never went out alone. Ah, uh, she looks down at her phone, trying to avoid my questioning eyes. We decided to cool it for a while. Okay, I respond. I can tell she doesn't want to talk about it. And knowing Dee, if she doesn't want to talk about something, she won't. Are you okay with that? Sure I am. Her face takes on a fake smile. It was my idea, okay? He wanted more, and I am not ready for that. It's fine, really. You ready? Okay, guess that means the topic is closed. We climb into Dee's Lexus before heading out to do some much-needed Christmas shopping. I somehow managed to cool her shopping high down today, and it is an almost pleasant experience. I pick up some clothes for Axel and a kick-ass black leather jacket that I decide he has to have, plus a few sexy pieces from Victoria's Secret for myself. I run into the local jeweler and pick up the piece I had commissioned out for his Christmas present. I can't wait to give it to him. I had the jeweler custom make a dog tag necklace for him. I used the tiny diamond from my old promise ring he had gave me the day he left for boot camp and engraved a message for him underneath it. You could hardly see the tiny diamond until the engraver placed some marks around the spot, highlighting it perfectly. It was hard for me to part with that ring— it held so many memories and promises. Knowing that Axel would open his gift and know what that diamond meant is the only reason I was able to do it. I spent hours searching for the right words to engrave on his dog tag. It finally hit me one day, and the words just popped into my head. When you are with me, I am free. My strength, my heart, my everything. Our love now continues forever. Amor vincit omnia. Love conquers all. It is perfect, and it is us. Axel has been secretive about what he has planned. He has gone off shopping a few times, but never came home with anything. Something told me to expect a proposal. And even though it freaks me out slightly that it is too soon, I know I will never be able to tell him no. He is my dreams. He is my future. It is almost time for our appointment with Sway, and I am both looking forward to and dreading the appointment. I just know that when Sway figures out who Axel is, there will be a big flamboyant display. What's with the big goofy grin? Dee asks, interrupting my thoughts. I didn't even realize I was smiling. I was just thinking about how Sway will react when he realizes the giant hunk of sex in the building next to his salon is Axel. Oh my god! I completely forgot about that! Girl, this is going to be hilarious! You are not kidding. I was hoping that he wouldn't find out, but when I told Axel the story, he thought it was too funny to pass up. Apparently the boys are coming over to say hello while we are there. She looks over at me in shock before continuing the drive to the salon. I expected humor, but she looks almost panicked. Are you okay, Dee? I know we don't get as much time to talk as we used to, but you seemed fine the other night. A slight frown crosses her face before she quickly clears her expression— I'm fine, just busy at work. Liar. I make a mental note to ask Axel if Beck has said anything lately. All right. But you know if you need to talk, I'm here. 
I'm always here for you, Dee. Ever since I moved out, things have felt strange with Dee. I know she's happy for me, and I know she loves Axel, but there is something going on. I love you, Dee. I hate knowing something is bothering you and you don't want to talk. It's nothing, she sighs. Just have some stuff on my mind, but I need to work it out on my own. Promise. She gives me one of her trademark smiles, and it reassures me enough to drop it. For now. We pull up at the salon fifteen minutes before our appointments, sitting in front, looking at the rows of businesses in the small strip. I can't help but smile when my eyes hit the simple, bold words, Core Security. The windows are blacked out so we can't see inside, but I know he's there. My man is close. As if my heart knows, it starts picking up speed. We get out of the car and start toward the building. Dee looks beautiful in fitted jeans, a long-sleeved sweater, and, of course, her pencil-thin heels. She attempted to get me to shed my old clothes, but I stuck with what was familiar. I will never have her classy style, but I am finally holding my own. I can see Sway inside waving at us like a crazy person through the floor-to-ceiling windows that line the salon. He is dressed similar to Dee, with skin-tight skinny jeans and a long pink sweater, but his sweater flares at the waist and elbows. He looks like a giant cotton candy wall. His boots are up to his knees, but unlike my flat soles, his are sporting five-inch heels. He has his long blonde wig pulled up into a sleek ponytail. Jesus, if I didn't love him, I would laugh. He looks wound up today, Dee laughs. Right when my feet hit the landing in front of Sway's salon, the door to Cor opens wide, and Axel is standing in front of me. His arms crossed over his wide chest in a smirk firmly in place. I am frozen with my hand outstretched to open the door, and Dee bumps into me from behind. Oh, wow, I hear her mumble behind me. Oh, wow is right. His dark denim jeans are molded to his powerful thighs, and his long-sleeved green henley is stretched tight. His thick black hair has the same look that it did this morning, when I had just gotten done running my hands through it and holding him tight to my pussy. Those green eyes I love so much shine bright. My panties are instantly wet. Get over here and give your man some love, he rumbles out, causing another surge of wetness to hit my panties. I throw my purse into Dee's arms and run over the short distance to Axel. Jumping up slightly, he catches me under my ass and hauls my body up his own. I can feel every hard inch rubbing against my front. I let out a soft moan before sealing my lips to his and diving into one of the best kisses ever. He gives my ass a squeeze before releasing my lips and smiling down at me. Hey, princess. Hey, baby. And that's when the shrieking began. Oh, my honey Jesus, you did not tell Sway that you knew this fine mountain of a man. No, you did not. Holy goodness, Lord above, I need a cold shower after that girlfriend. You get your pretty little self into my chair and you tell Sway all about it. Every single delectable thing about it, if you know what I mean. Sweet heavens, I need a drink. I turn my head from my perch in Axel's arms and laugh down at Sway. He is standing in the doorway of the salon, fanning his face. What is that? Axel asks softly into my ear, so only I hear him. Turning around with a bright smile, I say, That is Sway. He laughs. I don't know if I should laugh or run. I would run, you big beautiful hunk! Sway yells over my laughter. Oh, my lord, I would run! In fact, take that shirt off when you do, sweet lord, yes! I laugh harder and almost fall out of his arms. When I finally control myself, I look up into his smiling face. His smile is so wide and his eyes are full of love. Love hearing you laugh, princess. Most beautiful sound in the world. He drops me softly down onto my feet and holds his hand out to sway. Holt Reed, nice to meet you. Oh, honey, the pleasure is all mine. All mine. Sway's the name, but you can call me whatever you want. He places his hand delicately in Axel's big paw and bows. This time Dee joins me and we laugh at Sway's antics. Looking at the two of them together is one of the funniest things I have seen in a while. Axel is six foot six of pure, raw masculinity, and Sway, with all his short, round fatness stuffed in tight women's clothing, looks ridiculous next to him. Yo, Reed, 
We're going to finish this shit up, or do you plan on being here all fucking day? I hear the deep baritone of Greg call from inside the open door behind Axel. Oh, sweet lord in heaven, there are more? Sway asks, looking over his shoulder at me, his long ponytail slapping against Axel's chest. I can't answer because the look of horror on Axel's face has me in fits again. Come on, Sway, let's get you and giggles a lot inside, Dee says with a soft chuckle. She pushes me and I stumble sideways before composing myself. And if you don't help me get him out of here before the rest of them file out, we might be here a while. He's panting is. All right, Sway, dream about my man later. Love you, baby, I call over my shoulder as we usher Sway back into his salon. Oh, Izzy girl, how do you let him get dressed? A shame, oh, it is a shame to let that man ever put clothes on. The rest of our trip turns out much the same. Sway doesn't shut up for a second and really loses it when he sees Greg and Maddox walk by the front windows. They both wave in greeting to Dee and me. Sway starts jumping up and down and goes on and on for the rest of my appointment about what an injustice it is that not one of those hunk pieces of sex with legs is gay. When we finally finish up with Sway, it is almost five. Axel's truck is still in the front, so Dee and I walk over to the office. The front reception area is done in black and gray. There is a reception desk in the middle with the core security logo in the center of the wall behind it in large block letters. The office is simple but professional. I smile at Emmy, the secretary, and ask if Axel is busy. Not at all, or at least he wasn't a second ago. He's been itching for you to finish up next door, but between you and me, he was too scared of that little blonde guy to come check. I like Emmy. She is soft-spoken and somewhat shy, but according to Axel, he wouldn't be able to run this place without her. She is around twenty-five with long blonde hair, light brown eyes, and a face full of freckles. She is the perfect image of the girl next door. I can't help but notice that every time all the guys are around, she is silent. But her eyes, they are always following Maddox around. Do you mind if I go on back? I ask. Go on ahead. Beck and Cooper are around here somewhere. Greg and Locke left a while ago. I can't help but smile when she blushes. Yep, this girl has it bad for Maddox. I'm waiting here, Dee says. I look over at her and she is expressionless and the walls are up. There is definitely something going on with her, and I would bet it has everything to do with Beck. All right, be right back. I walk down the long hallway in search for Axel, passing the many open doors of the other guy's offices before reaching my destination. I can't help but smile at how successful Axel has become. I always knew he was destined for greatness. Loud and very infuriated tones reach my ears before I can knock on Axel's door, causing me to pause. What the fuck do you mean you can't find the motherfucker? He asks in a low and lethal tone, one well, that means he has lost all patience. Uh-oh. Silence. He what? Silence. Fuck. No. I don't want you to sit there and play with yourself, dumbass. Find him. I want to know where that bastard is. Some more silence follows, and then there's a lot more of Axel yelling before he finally slams the phone down in the cradle. I wait a little longer before pushing open his door with a soft knock. His enraged gaze hits me, and the tension is so thick I can't help but take a step back into the hallway. I let out a small squeak when my back hits someone standing behind me. Whipping around, I see Coop there, and Beck is standing farther down the hall. Coop's normally playful eyes are hard and determined. Beck doesn't look like the carefree guy I am used to. Everything okay? I question. The guys share a pointed look before Axel answers me, and when I look back over at him, he has carefully masked his fury. Yeah, princess. Get over here. And Coop? He looks over my shoulder with a scowl. Get your fucking hands off my woman. God, I love it when he gets all possessive. Coop laughs and scoops me up into a big hug and kisses my cheek, earning a deep growl and warning from Axel. You do realize he's armed, right, jackass? Beck asks with a smirk. Armed? I look over at Axel and don't notice anything out of the ordinary. Back holster, hanging behind the chair. My guess is he has at least five knives on him right now and an ankle holster. Coop whispers when he notices my unspoken question. Three, and no ankle holster today. 
Axel says with an evil glint to his eyes. Oh, boy. Right. Well, if you two are done pissing all over the floor, are you ready to go? Dee's in the lobby, and we're ready whenever you are. I walk over and offer him a quick kiss, knowing that if we don't get going, we won't get to dinner for a long while. Let me finish up in here. I need to brief these two idiots, and then we can leave. Go wait with Dee in the lobby. I can tell he means business. Whatever I had overheard before was starting to weigh heavily the air again with his temper. All right, baby. With one more kiss, I leave the office and shut the door behind me. I brush off his mood and continue down the hall. I know they don't handle small things here, and most likely, whatever has him heated up is just a normal kink in their day-to-day -day operations. With a smile, I walk back into the lobby and sit with Dee and Emmy. Before I know it, we are in a heated debate on the pros and cons of sexting. I make a mental note to send Axel some fun pictures the next time he comes into the office. Heavies is packed by the time we get there. Saturday is normally a big night for them, but tonight they are slammed. Maddox and Greg got here before us and held a table. We talked Emmy into joining us. So by the time everyone arrives, we are already getting loud and rowdy. We are sitting in the back corner, all eight of us squished around a small table. Food and beer are littering every surface. We have been laughing and having a good time for the last two hours. Once dinner is over... Axel pulls me into his lap and starts whispering all sorts of naughty things he plans to do to me later in my ear. I am trying to pay attention to the friends around us, but the only thing I can think of is getting back to the house. What the fuck? I hear Dee gasp over the rock music pumping through the bar. I have to work at clearing my mind. Between Axel lust and the beer, I wasn't following her sudden change of mood. She is staring across the room, where Beck and Coop are at the bar getting the newest pitchers of beer. Coop is flirting with the bartender, but Beck currently has his tongue shoved down the mouth of what we like to call a heavy slut. Bar regular and downright trash. This wasn't normal Beck's style either. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that this is about getting under Dee's skin. That stupid little fucker, I hope his dick rots off, she yells in my ear. Axel starts shaking with laughter before I elbow him in the ribs. I give him a hard look before studying Dee. Now that the alcohol has loosened her up, I can see that, under the anger, there is hurt. Something happened between her and Beck. Before I can open my mouth and ask her what is going on, she is on her feet and across the bar. Uh-oh, looks like drama is about to start flying, Greg yells across the table from his corner next to Maddox and Emmy, who is wide-eyed and a little intimidated by our rambunctious group. What's her issue is, he asks. No clue. She wouldn't talk about it. I thought they'd been spending time together. Not since last weekend. I don't know the details, but he showed up at my place pissed as fuck and itching for a fight. We all watch as Dee walks up to the bar and grabs the heavy slut by the roots of her badly dyed blonde hair, pulling her from Beck's hold. I can't hear the words, but her face looks horrible. I don't think I've ever seen hatred like that coming from my little ball of joy. What the fuck? I make a move to get off Axel's lap and go help, but he tightens his arms around my waist. No. One word, but no bend. He isn't going to let me wade in. Ax, I have to. No, not your fight. They need to work this shit out themselves. We watch for a few more seconds. To my fascination, Dee throws all her strength into a move that would make any badass proud. She pulls her hand out farther and literally throws this woman across the room. I think everyone at the table is shocked, but then she jumps in Beck's face, giving a few stabs of her finger to his chest and a lot of words before he gives her a feral smile. She cocks her head to the side and shrieks loudly when he jumps forward and throws her over his shoulder. Before anyone can blink, they are out the door. What the hell just happened? I ask. Oh, my God. Emmy gasps. Maddox is silent, but Greg barks out a loud laugh. Princess, that's what happens when shit festers and bitches act like bitches. I turn on Axel and give him a hard glare. He pulls both his arms from my body and holds them up in surrender. Shut up. Is she going to be okay? I ask, all joking aside. Yeah, baby. My guess is she'll just be well fucked in the morning. 
I'll second that, Coop says when he slides into the seat D left. That was some crazy shit. Who knew that little Miss Cheerleader had it in her? All the guys laugh, but I can't help my worry that D might be in over her head with Beck. The night continues with more beer, great food, and a lot of laughter. Even Emmy starts to come out of her shell a little, yet with one look at Maddox, she is right back in there. Axel started rubbing his hands up my legs thirty minutes ago, and I am about to come out of my skin. You almost ready, princess? He asks against my neck, biting the skin softly before letting me turn my head. If you say no, I can't be held responsible for my actions. I'm so fucking hard right now, I'm ready to throw you down on the table and take you in front of everyone. And blast off. Let's go. He smiles, and we quickly say our goodbyes before heading home. We didn't make it two steps into the house before he had me against the wall and screaming in pleasure. Chapter 19 Oh, God. I throw my head into the pillow and moan loudly. My stomach lurches when I feel Axel move next to me. You okay? He questions, rubbing his hand down my naked back. I shake my head. That does nothing but make my stomach protest. You didn't drink that much, baby. What's got you upset? Stomach, I croak. Oh, shit. I jump out of bed and run naked across the room and slam myself onto the floor in front of the toilet. Everything from last night comes rushing up. I feel Axel come behind me and gather my hair before pressing a cold cloth to my neck. Just let it out, princess. I knew all that barbecue was going to bite you in the ass. Shut up, I grumble before letting out a few more heaves. There is nothing left in my body, but my stomach is still in knots. Just the thought of all the food I consumed last night causes more heaving to rush up the back of my throat. Axel stays with me until I feel well enough to get up. I brush my teeth and let Axel carry me back to bed. Better, he asks, the worry clearly dancing over his face. Yeah, I'm okay. I guess stuffing the last two plates in my mouth last night wasn't the wisest decision, huh? He offers me a weak smile before kissing my forehead and standing from the bed. For the first time in months, the sight of his naked body doesn't immediately make me want to jump him. No, not today. Let's try some toast, okay? he asks. I can tell he's about to crawl out of his skin. He is so concerned something is wrong. I'm okay, baby. Just state something wrong last night. I'm good. I offer him a weak smile before pressing my face into his pillow and pulling in his scent. My nerves calm instantly. He stands there next to the bed for a few minutes to make sure I'm okay before walking off. I hear him rummaging through the dresser, assumingly to get dressed. Be right back, princess. Okay, I mumble, already falling back to sleep. Axel returns after a couple minutes carrying a tray with dry toast and ginger ale. He smiles shyly at me when I look up at him. God, I love you, I say. Love you too, princess. How's the stomach? Better. At least it isn't protesting the sight of food. We sit there for a while, and I slowly eat the breakfast. Everything seems to be staying down, and I see the concern start to leave Axel's eyes. What's your plan for today? He questions, clicking the channel over to the local news. Not much. Just catching up on some clients that needed a few things. I actually plan to finish wrapping up his presents, but he doesn't need to know that. I need to tell you something, and I'm not sure how you're going to take it. I don't like the sound of that at all. I put the tray on the table next to the bed and shift to look at him. Okay, I'm listening. I can already tell I won't be happy by the way he keeps looking at me with dread. Axel, I prompt. Okay. So I want you to remember that everything I do is to protect you. Got that? I nod my head, narrowing my eyes. Right. So I've had the guys keeping tabs on that fuckwad for a while now. So far, we haven't had an inch to go on until last week when Locke finally found some irregularities in the company reports. I go to interrupt him, but he just shakes his head. Do not ask me how he got those. You don't need to know the particulars. Anyway... He's been combing over those reports day and night and finally put it all together. Deep, baby. He's been pulling thousands, I'm talking hundreds of thousands, right out from under the old man's nose. 
Two days ago, Locke followed that trail right into Brandon's pockets. Long story short, Locke sent a nice care package to dear old dad outlining and showcasing all the evidence. The last thing I heard from my inside guy was that the old man went balls to the fucking wall mad. Police were called in and warrants sworn out for Brandon. He studies my face, looking for any sign of displeasure with him for disregarding my wish to just let it all be. He won't find any. As upset that I am at him for keeping his thumb on Brandon, I know why he did it. Respect it, even. And, I add, I know there is more, Axel, or you wouldn't be sharing. My tone is neutral, but my body is wound tight. I had a guy on him. Not one of our men, but one who I know and trust. Brandon, at this moment, is unaccounted for. Police are looking for him. The boys are looking for him. I'm looking for him. They won't hide from me. Hear me now, baby. I will find that fucking shit. But I need you to be safe. Stick close this week, okay? I know you aren't happy about this, but it needed to be done. I reach out and grab his hand, giving him a small squeeze. I understand. I'm not mad. A little upset, maybe, but I understand where you're coming from. If I'm honest, I don't think I would feel safe knowing he was floating around there. I gave him a small smile, noticing that the worry lines have left his face. I'll find him. A threat. There will be no mercy from this man if he gets his hands on Brandon. I snuggle into his side, and we spend the rest of the morning in our bed watching TV and just enjoying being together. The rest of the day passes uneventfully, housework and catching up on some of the things I put off throughout the week. I've been calling Dee all day, but so far haven't heard from her. Axel tells me to leave it be for the day. Chances are she isn't able to come to the phone anyway. He tries to call back when I wouldn't leave him alone, but just gets voicemail. With a smile and a shrug of his shoulder, we go about the day. I decide to take his advice and just let her call me when she is ready. I am still not feeling back to normal, so the night ends with us watching movies in bed before drifting off to sleep. Monday morning starts off much like the morning before, Axel gives me a kiss before the sun is even up and tells me that he needs to go into the office for a few hours, but will be back for lunch. Rolling over slowly, I try to calm my stomach, but I'm unsuccessful and dashing off to the bathroom a few minutes later. I spend the next thirty minutes dry heaving into the toilet before I am able to crawl back to bed. I drift off to a restless sleep not long after my head hits the pillow. I jolt awake when a chill climbs up my spine— Throwing off the covers, I run down the hallway and stairs before crashing into the office. Pulling up my calendar, I start doing some math in my head. It doesn't take me long before I am dropping heavily into my desk chair. Holy shit. It can't be. I sit there staring out the window above my desk, watching the trees sway in the breeze and the water down by the lake ripple with the wind. It makes sense. That was a week after the attack at my house. I remember taking my pill every day like clockwork. But I was also taking some heavy antibiotics. Holy shit. I drop my forehead on the desk for a few minutes and allow myself a few seconds to freak out. I pick up the phone on my desk and try calling Dee again, but have no luck. It is still early, so I leave a message for her to call me as soon as possible. I disconnect the call before picking the phone up again and calling my doctor, making an appointment for a few hours from now. On shaking legs, I make the climb back up the stairs and quickly get ready. I don't even bother with my hair or makeup. I just throw on some jeans and a sweatshirt before dashing out the door. I make it to the doctor by 9.30 and quickly sign in. I don't have to wait long before my name is being called. I go through the motions with the nurse and then sit, wait, and silently freak out. An hour later, it's confirmed. I'm pregnant. Holy shit, I'm pregnant. When was your last menstrual cycle, Ms. West? The older man asks. Um, I don't know. I think it was October, maybe early November. I have no clue. I'm still in shock. I don't remember. I'm sorry. I mumble lamely. That's all right, dear. Let's go down to the ultrasound room and take a look, okay? I don't answer him. I just follow behind him as he guides me into a dimly lit room. This is Jane. 
She is going to do your ultrasound, dear. We can talk when she finishes up. He offers a kind smile before stepping out of the room. I turn my shocked gaze to Jane. She looks like Nurse Hatchet. Undress from the waist down. Sheet goes over your legs. I'll be right back. And then she's gone. I follow her instructions and sit gingerly on the edge of the exam table. My heart feels like it is going to pop right out of my chest. I have no idea how Axel is going to handle this. Besides the brief discussion by the docs that day, we haven't discussed children. I knew he was still having issues with the loss of our first child. The child he didn't know about until recently, but this is different. This is our fresh start. This is our new beginning. I place my hands over my stomach protectively. A baby. We are going to have a baby. I allow myself a small smile but slip my hands from my stomach when a brief knock sounds and Jane walks back in. She wears a condom over the probe and asks me to spread my legs. I blanch but do as she asks. After one awkward slow thrust, I look over at the monitor and stare in fascination as a tiny, grainy dot appears. Well, there you go, she says, and for the first time she sounds almost sweet. That dot there is the fetus. Looks like you are about five, almost six weeks along, which puts your due date at August 3rd. She prints off a small picture of the baby blob and hands it over into my shocked fingers. I quickly get dressed, not once taking my eyes off the picture of our baby. Our baby. As I stand there in the middle of the ultrasound room, the biggest sense of peace settles around me. Axel and I are going to have a baby, and I can't wait to share the news. I am scared, but I know deep in my heart that he will be happy. Placing my hands back over my flat stomach, I promise to protect this little being with everything I have. This baby is so loved already. The love is overflowing into my body, and I am walking on cloud nine. Heaven absolute heaven. This is what it feels like to have the world. I get home a little before lunch, quickly hiding the ultrasound picture away until I find the perfect way to tell Axel this has to be special. He wasn't there the last time, never got to experience the shock and joy of learning that he was going to be a parent. I can't wait to experience that with him this time. With only a week to go before Christmas, I know the perfect way to let him know. Axel gets home shortly after I do. We enjoy a nice lunch before he carries me upstairs for dessert. I love afternoon dessert with Axel. Luckily for me and my anticipation, the rest of the days before Christmas are spent with Axel trying unsuccessfully to locate Brandon. I am not focusing on that right now because I know that tomorrow I will be sharing my news with Axel. It is Christmas Eve, and we have decided to spend the night in and watch old movies. I finally got a hold of Dee two days ago. She has basically disappeared since Beck carried her out of the bar. She was short and, I could tell, frustrated. We made tentative plans to exchange our gifts tomorrow, but that was all. I drift off to sleep with a smile on my face and butterflies in my belly, Tomorrow is the day I make one of our dreams come true. Good morning, princess. Merry Christmas, I hear whispered lightly in my ear, followed by a soft kiss behind my ear. Time to get up, breakfast, and Santa, he says with a smile. If you're playing Santa, can I sit on your lap first? I reply, rolling over and rubbing my throbbing nipples against his chest. He lets out a groan before bringing his lips down to my own. He trails slow kisses and nips down my neck and across my collarbone, and then drags his tongue across the swell of my breast before taking a painfully hard nipple into his mouth. He sucks deeply and flicks the tiny barbell with his tongue, bringing up his hand and pinching my other nipple between his fingers. I feel a sensation all over my body. How ready for me are you, princess? Is your sweet fucking pussy dripping for me yet, begging for my dick? He draws his hand down my stomach, and my oversensitive skin screams for the feelings only he can bring me. 
Oh, princess, want me to make you fucking scream? Oh, yes, please, Axel. Please, I need you so fucking bad. I beg. My pussy is begging to be filled and fucked hard. Jesus Christ, Izzy, you're fucking soaked. He brings his hand up, and I can see my juices glistening on his fingers. He licks his fingers clean before taking his rigid flesh in his hand and rubbing it against my clit. The most exquisite shocks shoot up from my core. My womb clenches, and I groan loud and shamelessly. My girl wants my dick, doesn't she? he asks. I nod my head. Speech is beyond me now. I can feel the claws of my climax climbing up my spine. Every inch of my skin is on fire. I feel his broad head stretching my entrance before he gives a slow thrust, seating himself deep within me. Oh, my God! I scream and clench down on his dick. He hisses and holds still and deep. Baby, gotta stop or I'm going to come right fucking now. Goddamn, your tight pussy loves my dick. He drops his head to my neck and clamps down before moving his hips. He starts off slow, building the friction, until I almost can't take it anymore and gradually builds up speed. Before I know it, I am screaming his name and he is slamming into my waiting body. He brings his hands down and lifts my hips up to meet each one of his powerful thrusts. My hands snake around his body, and my nails bite the skin before I throw my head back and scream. I swear the house is falling around us. Lights are exploding and the world is shaking. With one more powerful thrust, I feel the warm jets of his orgasm empty into my body. We lie there for some time while our bodies return to earth. Rubbing my arms back and forth across his sweaty back, I kiss the side of his face. Merry fucking Christmas, I whisper enjoying the feeling of his semi-hard dick moving with his laughter inside of me. Tremors are still shooting through my body. Merry fucking Christmas is right, princess. He slowly pulls out of me, and we both let in a sharp pull of air at the loss of each other. He makes quick work of cleaning me off before we get dressed and make our way down to the living room, where we set up Christmas. I busy myself with making breakfast while he sets up the living room. He starts bringing in boxes from all over the house and, with a devilish smirk, joins me in the kitchen. Where did all of that come from? I ask in awe. Been busy, baby, he says, sitting down and starting in on his pancakes. Obviously. I smile and join him, making quick work of breakfast so we can get down to gifts. He doesn't stop smiling the whole time we eat, and by the time we finish we are both sporting ridiculously happy grins. We start with his gifts. They start off small. Some new design programs for my computer I've been looking for. Earrings. Some barely there garments that earn a slap from me. Some odds and ends things I have been raving about for the house. And finally, a large but flat package is pulled out from behind the tree. When I look at him with a question, he just gestures at the package. I walk over from the recliner I was lounging in and start to gently pull the paper off. When I finally get it off, I notice that I am looking at the back of a very large canvas of some kind. He is looking at me with patience, but also a small bit of fear. I wrinkle my brow at him before turning it around. When I see the picture looking back at me, I almost lose it. It is beautiful. The old me would have looked at this picture like I had so many times over the years and let the painful memories consume me. But now, with Axel by my side, I can look at it and smile— I can look at this picture and see the overwhelming love two young kids had for each other. It's stunning, Axel. I love it. My words are so soft they are barely audible. You aren't mad, are you? You left that box of pictures out a few weeks ago and I got the idea. He seems to be walking around on eggshells, worrying that I won't like it, or worse, that it will cause me pain. God, no, it's perfect. And it is. The picture is of Axel and me the day he left for boot camp. I still remember the day my mom brought it back from the store. She had a smile on her face and tears in her eyes. They had framed it and given it to me the same day. In the picture, Axel was hanging out the bus window, one hand hanging onto the window frame and the other reaching down and holding mine. You can just see his broad shoulders dressed in his camouflage and his newly shaved head. I still remember taking my father's clippers to his silky locks the night before he left. I was standing on the tips of my toes, stretching up as tall as I could and meeting his waiting lips in a sweet kiss. I had bought a new soft yellow sundress to wear that day, 
and it was hanging beautifully from my youthful body. There is so much love, promise, and sadness in that picture. It is us. It is our past and our future, and it is absolutely perfect. With tears rolling down my face, I carefully lean it against the wall before throwing my arms around his neck and peppering his face with kisses. I love it, Axel. It is the best gift I have ever received. I love you so much. I love you too, princess. He kisses me softly and wraps his arms around my back, holding me tight to his body. We stay like that for just a second, soaking in the peaceful contentment that swirls in the air. My turn, I ask into his neck. Not yet, princess. One more. He loosens his hold on me, placing my feet back onto the floor and takes a step back. Reaching into his pocket, he pulls out a small blue box before dropping to one knee in front of me. The tears that stopped from before are back with a rush. Oh, my God. Izzy, from the first moment our eyes met, I knew you would be mine forever. There wasn't a day that passed that you didn't hold my heart. Everything I've ever done in my life was with you in mind, even when I didn't think this moment would ever come. It was all I prayed for. We might not have had the easiest road to get here, but no, from this day forward, I will do everything within my power to ensure that there is nothing but perfection. The happiness and love we deserve, baby. Will you do me the greatest honor and become my wife? When he finishes... I can hardly see him through the tears gathering around my eyes, blurring my vision before falling down my face. Yes! Yes, a million times over! I yell and drop to the ground in front of him, throwing my arms around his neck and kissing him with so much love and exuberance. Yes! I scream, throwing my head back and smiling wide. He laughs and opens the box. Inside is a stunning ring. A large round center diamond is set high in the thick platinum band. On each side of the center stone are three rows of more diamonds, the center row being slightly larger than the two on the outside. It is the most beautiful ring I have ever seen in my life. He slips it on my finger and brings a hand up to his lips for a soft kiss. You're finally going to be my wife, he says against my hand, his warm breath tickling the skin. You're finally going to be my husband, I smile back. I give him another kiss before pulling away and looking down at my hand. I can't help but just think finally, finally, finally. Okay, this will be hard to top. He offers an arrogant smile before walking over to plop down on the recliner I just left. Oh yeah, princess, there is no way you are topping that, he replies, pointing down at my hand. I smile to myself and start handing him the boxes. He laughs when he gets to the Victoria's Secret lingerie. Great minds think alike. We laugh together and he places the box off to the side. I hand him the box with the dog tag and watch his face when he opens it. He sits there for the longest time just looking into the box. His face is void of emotions. Jesus, he chokes out. Izzy, princess, this is fucking amazing. He looks at it for a few more minutes and asks me what the line at the end means. Love conquers all, I reply with a smile. He fingers the necklace lightly and notices the diamond for the first time. Is that? He trails off. Yeah, I kept it. Locked away, but I never let that ring go. I thought it was perfect. It is. It is perfect, he whispers. He looks up and the emotion in his depths causes me to stagger a bit. Wear it always, never coming off, he says, pulling it from the box and pulling the chain over his head, dropping it to set against his chest. One more, I say the butterflies picking up speed in my stomach. You kind of helped me pick this one out, actually, I add, walking over to the tree and pulling out a small box. The smile on his face is one of pure bliss. This day has been perfect and I pray this will be the icing on the cake. He starts tearing off the paper and opens the lid on the box before pulling out the mug. He has it backwards at first, and looks at me with a perplexed expression that turns to a questioning one when he notices my nerves. Spin it, I say, twirling my finger in a circle. He takes the coffee mug and spins it around. I watch when the clouds clear and his jaw drops in shock. He looks up at me. 
down at the coffee mug, to my belly, then back to my face before returning his eyes to the mug he's holding reverently in his hands. He sits there, his head bowed, and just looks at the mug. I picture it in my mind, knowing what he is seeing, and a small smile tugs at my lips. The gray mug has a copy of the first ultrasound picture on it, and underneath the picture it says, Number One Dad, coming this summer. He is silent for so long that I start to worry. Oh, God, I didn't think what I would do if he isn't happy about it. I can't stand the thought of being without him, but if he doesn't want our baby, I would have to learn. Axel? I question. He sets the mug down on the coffee table before climbing to his feet. I don't catch his expression before he wraps his arms around me softly and holds me close. I still can't judge his mood or feelings about becoming a father. The worry inside me is starting to take root, and I feel like I might be sick. Princess, he whimpers. His giant body starts to shake slightly under my arms, and I realize he is too overcome with emotions to talk right now. I hold him and he holds me. I can feel his tears wetting the skin through my shirt. My own are coming freely. He leans back and looks into my eyes, bringing his arms around and wiping his eyes clear. A baby. You're having my baby, he says in astonishment. We're having a baby, he repeats a huge smile coming over his face. We're going to have a baby, he booms through the living room and picks me up in a tight hug before spinning me around. I laugh at his liveliness. He drops me to my feet again and slams down to his knees, pulling up my shirt and pressing a soft kiss to my flat stomach. Splaying his hands wide across my belly, he whispers to the skin, We're going to love you so much, little one. I hiccup on a sob and run my hands through his hair. He looks up at me with his bright emerald eyes full of peacefulness and blinding love. We're having a baby. He wraps his arms tightly around my middle and holds me close with his head against my stomach. I hold his head to my skin and echo back to him. We're having a baby. Chapter 20 I still can't believe it. Not only am I engaged to be married, but our baby is growing inside my body. Once Axel was over his shock, we spent the rest of the day in bed, celebrating, as he said. I can't say no to him. He is over the moon, and I want that closeness only he can give me. We fell asleep well after midnight, his arm draped over my stomach, holding my belly with his large hand. My phone starts buzzing the next morning, reminding me that I set my alarm so I could get up and over to Dee's before it got too late. Axel and I have plans to go to dinner tonight and celebrate, with clothes on this time. I lift Axel's arm off my belly and walk across the room to the bathroom, pausing to look over at his sleeping form. I see that the dark sheets are riding low on his naked hips. He has one arm over his abdomen and the other stretches out under my pillow. The desire to crawl back in bed and cuddle close is strong, but I need to hurry so I can make my plans with Dee and be home early enough for dinner. Once Dee and I get talking, I know I won't be home any time soon. I pull on my favorite pair of black leggings and an oversized knit sweater. Grabbing my black boots, I walk out of the closet and almost collide with Axel. I look him over from head to rock-hard dick to toe. Good enough to eat. You're killing me, Ax. You know I have to get going before Dee starts knocking the doors down here. It should be illegal for you to look that good in the morning. I brush my hand down his stomach and grab a hold of his dick, stroking him lightly a few times. I love how hard you are for me. I kiss the corner of his lips and step away before he can grab me. A low rumble sounds from his lips. You remember this moment tonight when you're begging me to let you come. I'm going to keep you right on the edge for hours. Hours, baby. He swats my butt before walking into the bathroom and turning on the shower. Call me when you get there, he yells over the spray of the shower. Will do. Love you. My phone rings on the way over to Dee's house. I answer and press speaker before placing the phone back down. Hey, you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, baby girl. Greg's deep voice comes through the line. Missed you yesterday. I feel a little bad about closing our friends out yesterday, but with it being our first Christmas back together, plus one that was so full of special moments for us as a couple, 
It didn't feel right to open it up for everyone. I know, G. I missed you, too. I'm on the way over to Dee's house now if you want to come meet us for lunch. I've got your gifts in the car. Plus, I've got some news for you. I smile when the line goes silent. I know, Greg. Right now, he is probably picturing every kind of news I could possibly have for him. He might correctly guess one, but there is no way he would guess them both. Wouldn't miss a baby girl. I've got some work to finish up before I head over. Give you and Dee some time to do your thing. Sounds good. I'm glad I get to see you today. I was just telling Axe last night that we needed to have you all over for dinner. Something tells me Reed didn't want to share your time, right? Uh, something like that. I laugh, and we continue with the small talk before hanging up. I try calling Dee to let her know Greg is coming, but she doesn't answer. I brush off the flicker of worry that floats across my skin. Knowing Dee, she is still in the bathroom with the music cranked up to ungodly levels while she gets ready. I pull up into the driveway of my old home with Dee and climb out. It is a beautiful morning. The sky is clear and blue, and the winter chill is blowing softly. There was talk of snow this weekend, but knowing Georgia weather, it would change a few times before the weekend hit and there would be no snow. My hair flies around my head when a strong gust hits my face, causing me to shiver. Pulling my coat tighter to my body, I walk to the back of my car. I gather all the gifts I have for Dee, leaving some for Greg to get later. My hands are full enough with the things I have for Dee. Walking up the small walkway, I pause to pull my keys out of my pocket. If she were up, she would have already come running out the door like a cheerleader on crack. I drop a few of the packages in my arms before I am able to pull my keys out of my waistband. Shit! I forgot to call Axel. Pulling my phone up, I press his name and wait for it to start ringing as I push my key in the lock. It clicks, but before I can open the door, it swings wide, and I meet the disturbing brown eyes of my ex-husband. Hey, princess, I hear coming through the line. Brandon smiles his cold and evil smile. You there? I hear calling from far off. My body is frozen in terror. Hello there, Isabel, Brandon says. There is so much control in those three words, but they are heavily laced with menace. All the packages fall from my arms, joining my phone on the front steps. Izzy? I hear it before Brandon reaches up and slams his fist into my temple, causing the world around me to fade into black. God, why does my head hurt? Shit! I roll over but stop when my head starts to pound. Why don't I remember what happened? Ah, Isabel, glad you could join us. My eyes snap open and I look around Dee's living room. It all comes rushing back and my blood turns to ice when I look up and see Brandon standing over Dee. He's got her arms tied behind her back and a piece of tape slapped over her lips. Her eyes are wide and terrified. I can already see a bruise forming around her cheek and her hair is pulled to the side of her ponytail. She tries to stay strong, but there are dried tear tracks all over her face. This little bitch was nice enough to invite me in. Nice to know her manners aren't lacking. I was just asking her a few questions about my lovely wife when you drove up. Thank you, Isabel, for making it so easy to find you. He shakes his head back and forth and begins pacing in a tight line behind D. I move my eyes from his face to hers and check on her again. I can see her pleading with me not to do anything stupid. Her eyes are wide, and she keeps shaking her head softly. Your little boyfriend has been causing some trouble, Isabel. I warned you what would happen if he didn't back off. I wonder how long it will take that motherfucker to come riding to the rescue, hmm? His pacing continues, and when Dee lets out a soft whimper, his hand shoots out and backhands her hard across the face. She falls back off the couch and doesn't move. That was all it took to snap me out of my shock. You bastard! I scream and go to move from my spot on the floor, but stop short when he trains a gun on me. Oh, no, I wouldn't do anything rash. My dear wife seems to have forgotten her place in the world. We can't have that now, can we? You sit the fuck down and shut up, you stupid whore. I pause in my motion, but quickly scan the room. There has to be another way. I won't let him win. He controlled me for too long, and I am finally happy. Fate is finally on my side. I steady my resolve and straighten my spine. I will win. 
I go to get up again when he walks quickly over to me and grabs me by my loose hair. He bends down and brings his face right up to mine. His words are harsh, and he spits all over my face when he speaks. You little slut! You think you can run around spreading your legs for another man? You are mine! Do you hear me, Isabel? I won't let that bastard touch what is mine! He screams. My hair feels as if it is being ripped from the roots when he begins to pull me to my feet. Please, Brandon, please leave us alone. What do you want? Money? I can get you plenty. Please leave, I beg. My only thought is getting free and getting Dee and my baby safe from his insanity. He swings his wild eyes on me and throws his head back. The sound that comes out is animalistic and has me scared out of my mind. The chill of dread rocks through my body, all the way to my bones. You think I'm going to let him have you? Oh, no, Isabel. What you need to understand is that you will never get rid of me. He thinks he can take you from me? He can try, but he will be swimming through a sea of bullets before I let him get those vile hands on my wife. I can see the control in his eyes snap, and it's like watching a light go out. This is not my ex-husband. The irrational madness has taken over any common sense and chance of reason I could have made with him. I'm going to make him watch you when I bend you over my knee and punish you for all the shit you have caused. I'm going to rip your clothes from your body and make him watch me take you for all the shit he caused. That's right, he says when my eyes widen. You think I don't know it was him or the police barking at my heels? And then do you know what will happen next? He doesn't even blink when he pauses. That malevolent smile forms, and his face is transformed from his normal, somewhat handsome look to one of pure evil. Then I'm going to put a bullet through your fucking heart while he watches, while he is helpless to stop me. Even with the fear coursing through my body, I know I have to get away from him. He's blocking the hallway to the front door, but not the one off to the kitchen. It's risky, but I might be able to get away quickly enough to hide. I know Axel is coming, and that has me more afraid than the madman standing in front of me with a gun. A low moan sounds from the couch, and I see Dee start to stir. Shit! I can't leave Dee. Why, Brandon? I ask hoping to distract him from D. I have to keep him focused on me. Why? Because that motherfucker ruined everything. I was finally going to have it all, and he had to ruin it all. I won't let him take you, too. You are mine! He screams. He brings his hand up and starts pulling at his hair, and banging the handle of the gun against his forehead before leveling it back on D. He's completely lost it. There isn't an ounce of humanity left in this man. His pacing continues. He moves slightly from the open hallway, but he doesn't move his gun from Dee's body. I see a shadow cross the threshold, and my heart picks up speed when I realize who it is. Greg. Oh, God, no. I'm going to lose everyone I love in one moment if Brandon sees him. He holds his finger up to his lips. He taps his wrist and then cocks his head toward the kitchen, silently telling me to run when he makes a move. My heart is going to stop. There is no way it can beat this rapidly and not just give out. These eyes are wide. She looks over at me and I can see the fright in her alarmed brown eyes. I bring my hand to the side and motion to her to wait and then bug my eyes toward the kitchen. Her legs aren't bound, and if she can run, we might be able to get out of this room. We wait in stone-cold fear while Greg inches closer to Brandon. But before he can reach him, Brandon spins around... He seems to pause for a second in confusion, and that's all it takes for me to jump up, grab Dee by the arm, and pull her with me as we run into the kitchen. I hear the sound of them colliding behind me as we take off. The sound of the gun going off causes me to falter. I push Dee behind the island and look around for some form of protection. Damn, the knives are by the open doorway we just ran through. The only thing I can see is a cast-iron frying pan left on the oven from Dee's breakfast. Thank God. Picking it up, I test the heaviness of the metal out in my hand before holding it down to my side. I bend down and check on Dee. She is shaking but seems okay. Get under the desk and don't you move, I tell her. I make quick work of the knot behind her back before letting her move from my side. I watch her scurry around the far side of the island and burrow under the desk built into the wall. I push the chair in behind her and cover her body the best I can. Moving back to the center island, I brace my legs apart and wait. 
I don't know who is going to come around that corner, but I'm ready. I won't let him win. I won't let him take my happiness. It's time that I remember what is important and fight for the future I want. The future I deserve. The future I have earned. A future with Axel and our baby. With an evil laugh I hear him and my fears are confirmed. Oh, God! Greg! Oh, Isabel! Come out, come out, wherever you are! He laughs again before stumbling into the kitchen. Where is that little bitch friend of yours, Isabel? He cocks his head to the side, and I notice that his left arm is hanging at an odd angle and the gun is missing. I feel slightly better knowing Greg was able to put up a fight. The fear for Greg bubbles back up, but I push it back and straighten my shoulders. I won't let this man win. Never again. Where is Greg? I ask, shocked that my voice sounds strong and sure. Don't you worry about him, Isabel. He takes a step forward. There are only a few more steps before he will have rounded the island. Come here, bitch! He spits out. No! My voice sounds powerful in the stillness of the house. You're gonna be sorry for that. He lunges forward, but doesn't make it far before I swing wide and crash the frying pan against his skull. He looks into my eyes in confusion before crumpling to the floor. I throw the frying pan to the side and jump over his fallen body. I run into the living room and almost fall to the floor when I see Greg's still form and the pool of blood forming under his chest. Choking on the sob that escapes my mouth, I begin to frantically look for the gun. I get on my knees and search under all the furniture before finding it in the far corner of the room tucked under the couch. I try a few times to reach it before I finally succeed. Right when my hands wrap around the handle, I hear him. Before I can straighten from the floor, my hair is gripped in his strong hands and he throws me towards the far wall. My body collides with Greg, who doesn't move even with the force of my weight slamming into him. His warm blood soaks through my side. I look up into Brandon's disturbing face and smile when I feel the cold metal of the gun still in my hands. He takes a step forward but stops when I raise the gun level with his chest. Fuck you! I scream and pull the trigger, emptying every bullet into his chest. I can hear Dee screaming from the other room, but before my arm falls back down I am overcome with the overwhelming fear running through my veins and let the numbness take over my body. I vaguely hear the gun hit the floor before I slump back against Greg's body, and the darkness rolls back in. Izzy! I scream again into the phone. I run down the stairs and jump into my truck. When I heard her ex-husband's voice coming through the line instead of Izzy's, I thought my mind was playing tricks on me. For days we have been searching for him. Not one goddamn clue to where he has been, and the second she is out of my sight, the worst possible situation is playing out and I am helpless. There is no way I can get there quick enough. I grab my phone while I tear out of the driveway and call Greg, the only one I can think of who will be close enough to save my girl. What's up, Reed? Just talk to... Shut up! Where the fuck are you? I interrupt. Damn, on my way to Dee's house, Izzy ca... Brandon is there! I interrupt again. I don't have time. Izzy doesn't have time. What? All teasing has left his voice now. Just got a call from Izzy, but it was him I heard over the line. I didn't hear her once, Greg. I take a second to calm down before I'm able to continue. The fact that I don't know if she is okay is not lost on me. I'm too far out. Get there. God, please get there and save my girl. I don't even realize that tears are rolling down my face until I hear the anguish that colors my words. Be there in five. I'll get her. Don't let him take them from me, I plead. Got it. He takes a deep breath, and I know, I know how much he is holding back right there. Greg loves Izzy, and for the first time, I realize just how powerful their bond is. He was her family and support when I couldn't be. If anyone else can understand what my panic feels like at this moment, it is Greg. I have to trust that he can make it in time. There is no way she can be taken from me twice. I break every speed limit and every traffic law to make it to D's in half the time it normally takes. 
pulling my truck right into the grass in front of her place and throwing it in park before jumping out and sprinting towards the door. I notice Greg's truck off to the side parked at an odd angle. I check but don't see him outside. The front door is wide open and there is no movement inside. Silence. Silence and sobbing. Pulling the gun out of my ankle holster, I slowly walk through the threshold and down the long hallway. The sobbing is getting louder, and for the first time since arriving, I breathe. That is a female sob. Hope flares to life and I rush around the corner but stop dead at the scene before me. The first thing I see is Brandon's lifeless body in the opening to the kitchen. I don't need to check to know he isn't breathing. No way would he survive with that many holes in his chest. D is on the floor next to the tangled mess of Izzy's and Greg's bodies. No! I roar, running towards them, slipping on the blood that covers the floor around them. Oh, God! Izzy! I c call 911! D stutters out next to me. It isn't hers! She whispers. What? I sob, running my hands down Izzy's still body, looking for any sign of injury before moving her gently to the side. Her chest is rising and falling normally, and her color is just slightly paler than normal. Besides a few cuts and bruises, she doesn't appear to be harmed. When I turn to Greg for the first time, her words register. Fuck! I roll him over and notice the wet hole on his side. Fuck! Ripping my shirt over my head, I press it against his belly and hope I can do enough to keep him stable before the ambulance arrives. Check his pulse! I say to Dee, but when I look over, she is weeping over Izzy's body. My heart stills for a second when I look again at her still form. Why isn't she moving? Bringing my attention back to Greg, I bring one hand off his wound and check his pulse. Slow, but there. I hold my shirt against him and wait. We wait for what seems like an eternity before the paramedics start running through the house. Greg is quickly loaded up and taken away with Dee in the back with him. I drop down next to Izzy, where the paramedics are working on her. Sir, sir, I need to ask you some questions, the officer off to the side asks. Not now! I run my hand over her hair and pray. She has to be all right. She has to survive. Why isn't she waking up? I ask the paramedic next to me. I don't know. Looks like her body's way of protecting itself. All her vitals are fine. Great, actually, considering. He gives me a look full of compassion. She's going to be fine. I let out the breath I didn't realize I was holding, drop my head to her shoulder, and cry. She's pregnant, I whisper to the man beside me. She's pregnant with my baby. My words sound odd to my ears, and I know I won't be able to hold it together for long if I don't see those beautiful pale eyes soon. Got it. We're going to load her up now. You the husband? He asks. Yes. I answer and quickly follow them out to the ambulance. Sir, we need your statement, the officer says, running behind us. Not now, I repeat. You want a statement? You get in your car and follow me to the hospital. I am not leaving her side, you hear me? The young officer stops short and seems shocked at the heat behind my words, not what he was expecting. I can tell he is gearing up to protest, but I quickly interrupt him. Look, I pause to check his name tag. Officer Benson, I'm not trying to fucking run off. That woman is my life, and I won't be letting her out of my sight after this shit. Can you just try to understand for a fucking second what I am going through and follow me to the goddamn hospital, yeah? I say, but turn around and climb in without waiting for his response. The ambulance pulls off, and I take her hand in my own and bend down to her ear. I love you. Princess, wake up now so I can see those eyes looking at me. Let me see that love, baby. I keep my head down to her ear and whisper everything and anything I can think of to let her know that she is safe and I'm here. The ten-minute drive to the hospital comes to a halt, and before they can roll her out, her eyes flutter open, and she meets my gaze. Hey there, princess, I say, the emotion thick in my voice and the relief rocking me to my core. Hey, my love. Axel, love you, she says weakly before closing her eyes and drifting off again. I jump out and follow the gurney into the emergency room, finally breathing easy for the first time since I answered her earlier phone call. 
The first thing I notice when I wake up is a quiet humming, opening my eyes. I look around the dimly lit hospital room, trying to orientate myself to my surroundings. I feel a soft tickle on my arm and move my head to the side to look down. Axel is sitting next to my bed with his chair pulled as close as he can get it. My right hand is held firmly in his, and his lips are pressed against my skin. The humming I keep hearing is coming from him, his soft whispering against my skin. He is speaking low enough that I can't understand the words, but the tone is light and loving. Axel, I say, my throat dry. It hurts to get the word past my lips. His head shoots up and his red-rimmed eyes meet mine. Princess, he whispers. Tears are forming in his eyes and a small smile tugs at the corners of his lips. My girl, my brave girl, he says, and a few tears fall over his lids. He closes his eyes tight and more spill over. I thought I'd lost you. When I walked around the corner and saw you, saw you lying in all that blood, he trails off, but not before his words hit my ears. Blood. I wasn't bleeding, was I? Oh, no, the baby. The, the baby, I whisper hoarsely. Please. I shake my head back and forth violently, tears of my own streaming down my face. Not our baby. Please, God, not our baby. What? Oh, Izzy, no, baby. The baby is fine. You are fine. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean your blood. Princess, stop crying. I promise our baby is fine. He's quick to reassure me over and over, telling me that our little miracle is safe and fine. When I finally calm down, I look into his eyes, his beautiful eyes. We're okay? I ask. You're both perfect, he responds, smiling, before giving me a soft kiss. Greg, D? I ask when he moves away to sit down on the side of my bed. D is going to be fine. She's shaken up, shaken up pretty fucking bad, but she will be okay. From what she said, Brandon had just tied her hands and taped her mouth. He had only been there for about an hour before you showed up. I think the worst of her injuries are where he clocked her when she opened the front door in a split lip. She's fine, baby. Where is she? I ask, looking around the room again. Beck made her leave. He is taking her back to his place for a while. She said she was putting the townhouse on the market. I take that in and try to process it. I understand. I wouldn't want to be there any more, either. I offered for her to stay with us for a while, but she said she would have to think about it. I scrunch my nose at that. Why would you need to think about staying with us? I don't know, Princess. That's something you'll have to ask her yourself. What about Greg? I ask, almost afraid to know. He's going to be okay. He came out of surgery a little while ago. It wasn't anything serious, even though it sure as fuck looked like it. Bullet went straight through and missed everything important. He's one lucky son of a bitch. He's really okay? There was so much blood axe, and he wasn't moving. He wasn't moving at all. My panic is coming back again at remembering the way Greg looked. Lifeless. He looked dead. Axel, I need to see him! I yell. Hey, hey, calm down, baby. I promise he's okay. He's in recovery. But I'll see what I can do about getting you on a field trip, okay? I look up and catch the slight concern that crosses over his eyes before he quickly masks it. I know he has to be a mess over everything that happened, but he is holding it in and being strong for me. Okay, I just really need to see him, Axel. I need to see with my own eyes that he's going to be okay. I understand, Princess. I'll make it happen. He leans down and gives me a gentle kiss. Got room for one more in there, baby? I need to feel you close. His mask slips slightly for me to see the vulnerabilities simmering under the surface. Yeah, yeah, I do. I respond and shift slightly so he can lean his body close to mine. His feet are hanging off the end and a good portion of his body is hanging off the edge. But he wraps his arms tightly around me and I cuddle close, breathing him in and letting the peace only he can give me wash over my body. I never want to feel that fear again, Izzy, he whispers into my hair and squeezes me tightly never been so scared in my life. We lie like this, together and entwined, until the nurse comes in. She fusses until he moves back to his chair. I can't help but laugh at the pout he is sporting while she finishes up her vitals checks. When he hears me, the look is instantly gone, and he looks over with a huge smile. Love that sound, princess. Most beautiful sound in the whole fucking world.
I stayed in the hospital overnight. There wasn't anything wrong with me, but they wanted to monitor my vitals and make sure that my head wound was okay. Luckily, I came out of the whole ordeal with only a small bump right next to my temple. When I'm released, Axel and I make our way to the floor Greg is on. Maddox and Cooper in the room when we get there. Greg is awake but groggy. I walk into his room on the arm of Axel, who hasn't let me go once since I woke up. Greg looks up and a small smile forms on his pale lips. Baby girl, he said with a tear falling from his eye. Baby girl, you are a sight. I walk over to the side of his bed and push Coop out of the chair he was sitting on, pulling it close to his bed. Hey. Yep, that is all I have before I break down and bury my head in the bed next to his hip. Axel comes up behind me and rubs my back. Baby girl, I'm okay. Nothing I can't handle. I thought you were dead, G. I cry harder into the bed. Don't ever do that shit again. He laughs but agrees, and I sit there holding his hand while the conversation continues around us. Coop tells Maddox about all the good-looking nurses who keep popping in offering sponge baths, and how he might have to get shot if that is what's waiting for him. Maddox shakes his head, but his eyes never leave mine. You okay, girl? he asks when Coop finally shuts his mouth. Axel gives my shoulder a squeeze and support, and I climb to my feet and walk over to Maddox. He opens his arms when I get closer and I wrap mine around his back. I'm okay, I say into his chest. Good. That's good, he says and gives me a small squeeze before releasing me. Get over here, Izzy, I hear Axel say behind me. I roll my eyes at Maddox before turning around and walking back to Axel. Mine, he says to Maddox and pulls me into his body. We get a rare laugh out of Maddox, and just like that, the tension in the room is lifted, and we are able to breathe easy again. Greg and Dee are fine, the baby and I are fine, and Axel's arms are around me. Life is good. Chapter 21 Four Months Later You almost ready, baby? Axel asks sliding his arms around my waist and rubbing his hands over my swollen belly. I started to really show a few weeks ago. My small pouch went from making me look slightly overweight to a definite baby bump. I love it, but I love it more when Axel comes up behind me and places his hands over my small bump. When I have moments like this, just Axel and me, I am reminded how lucky we are. It's been a hard road for us both since that day with Brandon. I have been plagued with nightmares— and Axel has been dealing with his worry about my mental state. About two months after Brandon's attack, I made an appointment with Dr. Maxwell. We both knew I wasn't dealing with taking his life well. Finally, four months later, I have come to terms with everything that happened. My nightmares are few and far between, but I am alive and so are the people I love. I have become stronger and stronger every day, and it is all because of this man." I continue to fix my makeup while he rolls his fingers around my skin. We need to get going soon if we're going to make your appointment. Okay, I'm hurrying. I would have been ready by now, but there's nothing that fits anymore. I put down my mascara and turn in his arms. I step up on my toes and wrap my arms around his neck, burying my hands into his thick hair. I look at myself in the mirror and can't help the small smile that forms. My hair is hanging in long waves down my back, my makeup is done in neutral tones to match the soft yellow color of my sundress. The material stretches across my ample chest, but flares out against my belly. Worth it, baby. I love seeing you carrying my baby. He brings his hands down and pulls me up by my hips, placing me on the counter. Be careful, Axel. Right now you're asking to be really late, I warn, opening my legs up for him to walk closer to my body. My dress pushes higher up my thighs. My belly pushes into his hard stomach. He barks out a laugh before pressing his lips to mine and making my toes curl with the heat of his kiss. Princess, I could take you right now and you wouldn't even fucking care if we missed that appointment. I don't think I don't know you've been crossing the days off until this one. He is not wrong. We have our 20-week baby appointment today and we are finally going to find out if we are having a boy or a girl— Axel is firm that it is a boy. I keep going back and forth, but deep down I hope it is. I can just picture a little version of Axel running around the house. 
I curl my hands into the fabric of his shirt, humming my agreement, and lean in for another kiss. Right before his lips hit mine, there is a sharp kick against my belly. Axel snaps back and looks down in complete shock. We have been trying to get him to feel the baby kick for weeks now, but either the baby wasn't having it, or Axel just wasn't there when the baby was active. Either way, this is the first time he has felt any movement. He looks down at my rounded stomach, and then quickly back up to my eyes. The look of pure wonder in his eyes brings a smile to my lips. He is completely transfixed with this little person in my belly. I reach down and grab his hands before placing them in the center of my bump. The baby kicks a few more times. I keep my eyes glued to Axel's face, watching the emotions play across his handsome features. Shock, awe, and enchantment. He is fascinated with this feeling, feeling of our baby. What are you thinking? I ask him after a few minutes. He looks up at me with his smile wide and his eyes bright. How fucking lucky I am. He leans down and gives me a kiss, not once removing his hands from my active belly. Hey! We hear Dee yelling up the stairs. Where are y'all? Axel groans and helps me down from the counter. He might have offered for Dee to stay with us, but I can tell she is starting to get under his skin. She has a knack of knowing right when things are heating up. I love her, but right now... She is my little happy cock blocker. Plain nice daddy, I laugh and slap him on the ass before walking around him and out of the bedroom. I slide my feet into some flip-flops and walk down to meet Dee in the foyer. She looks stunning in a long orange maxi dress that fits tight to her body. You suck, you skinny bitch, I say and smile up at her. Of course she towers over me in her four-inch heels. I'm the midget around the giants these days. The only thing that feels good is flip-flops. Whatever it is, you look beautiful, doesn't she, Axel? He snorts but keeps walking down the stairs. Where's G? I ask them. It's debatable who was more excited about the baby when we told everyone, D or Greg. We told everyone together when we had a small, family-only party at the house to welcome Greg home. He had stayed in the hospital for almost two weeks after the shooting, but was 100% healed now. When we told them, Dee broke down in tears. Maddox gave me a rare smile, Coop praised Axel and his super swimmers, and Beck offered a polite congratulations. Greg, however, had hollered his excitement and pulled me into a big hug, which earned a growl from Axel. Greg just laughed and hugged me tighter. From that day on, he's called daily and checked on my progress. He has bought baby books and is constantly filling us in on baby info. I knew he would be happy for us, but he is over the moon excited to become an uncle. He said he was running late. Something about an appointment and would meet us at the office. Axel calls from the kitchen. I look over at Dee, and she just shrugs her shoulders. I follow Axel's voice and find him in the kitchen, checking his emails on his phone. He looks up, and I stop when I see the hunger in his eyes. Look good enough to eat, princess. Can't wait to get back here so I can drag you back to the bedroom. Need to be buried deep, baby. Oh, my God, Is That was seriously hot, Dee says from behind me. I close my eyes and hear Axel let out a string of curses. How's the house hunting going, Dee? He asks, and I laugh at her puzzled expression. We love having you here, Dee, but have you thought about finding a place yet? She looks down and goes silent. Dee? I prompt. I don't know if I can do it yet, she says after a few seconds of silence. I give Axel a pointed stare and he gets it. Dee's been struggling since the Brandon scene. She has trouble feeling safe and usually sticks close to one of us. She has been working more and more at Axel's desk in the home office than he is. Okay, Dee, we get it. Promise. She looks over at me with a frown, and I can see the fear in her eyes. Stay as long as you want, Axel offers. She nods her head and then leaves the room to grab her purse. You okay with that, Ax? I know he's ready to have his house back but he just gives me a nod with nothing but understanding swimming in his green eyes. We leave the house a few minutes later and make the short drive into town to the ultrasound clinic. Axel holds my hand the whole way, and a content smile plays at his lips. I smile over at him and thank my lucky star that he is back in my life. When we pull up in front of the office, I see Greg standing outside the doors with his phone to his ear. He looks up when he hears the rumble of Axel's truck and quickly says his goodbyes. 
I look over at Axel, wondering if he caught the abrupt end to Greg's call. Stay out of it, Izzy. If he wants you to know, he will tell you, yeah? I grumble, but stay quiet while he walks around the truck and opens my door, before taking me gently around the hips and bringing me to my feet. I hear his moan when I brush against his cock. Do not get my dick hard right before I go see my baby. He laughs, but can't disguise the strain in his voice. Later. I promise and walk around him to give Greg a big hug. Dee hangs back, but comes up to give Greg a hug, too. You ready, baby girl? He asks with a smile. God, yes. Last minute guess on your niece or nephew? He smiles and looks over my shoulder at Axel. Boy, baby girl, that is definitely going to be a boy. Why do all of you seem so sure it's going to be a boy? They both laugh loudly, and Dee and I just look at each other with confused faces. Baby girl, look at him. There's no fucking way he made a girl. <laughs> no way. He is still laughing when we walk into the reception area and I sign in. I shoot him a few dirty looks before sitting down next to Axel and thumbing through a baby magazine. We wait for about fifteen minutes before they call me back. Is it okay if my family comes back too? I ask the technician. Sure, honey. The more the merrier. We follow her down a long hallway before entering the ultrasound room. It's a large room with a couch off the side and a large recliner next to the ultrasound machine. The only other thing in the room is a large projector pointing down from the ceiling. When I sit down in the recliner, I notice that the large wall in front of me is a screen for viewing. Here you go. Place this sheet over your lap. That way we don't flash everyone in the process. She laughs and helps me cover up. I look over to Axel and see the nervous anticipation on his face. He smiles at me and grabs my outstretched hand. Love you, he mouths to me. Love you, too, I return. All right, Miss West, let's get you ready. I smile at Axel one more time when I see the frown on his face over the use of my last name. He was not happy with me when I told him that I wanted to wait for the baby to be born before we got married. He grudgingly agreed when I bribed him with sex. It wasn't that I didn't want to be married to Axel, just the opposite. I couldn't wait to be Mrs. Axel Reed, but it just felt right that our baby be there with us. When I sat him down and explained my reasons for wanting to wait, he wasn't so upset anymore, but that didn't mean he was happy about it. I'm just going to do some measurements before we take a look and see if this little one wants to make an announcement today, okay? I nod my head, too engrossed with the image of our baby on the large screen in front of us. Axel squeezes my hand, and I hear him let out a shuddered breath. Amazing, I hear Greg whisper to Dee, who is too busy sniffling in her tissue to answer. When the baby's heartbeat fills the room, we all seem to pause in amazement. It never fails to fill my heart with joy to hear that fast-paced beating. You ready, Mom and Dad? She asks us with a smile. Yes, Axel says quickly before I can open my mouth. I look up at her and smile. She gives me a wink before turning her attention back to the screen. Well, will you look at that? Someone isn't shy at all, she laughs to herself, and we sit there all looking at the moving little image on the screen. It doesn't take long for us to see what she was talking about. Right there, larger than life, is my son just letting it all hang out. Axel lets out a loud whoop and jumps up from his chair. He leans down and gives me a kiss before slapping hands with Greg. I laugh at their antics and wipe the tears from my face. Axel comes back to my side and leans over me, taking my face in his hands and pushing his nose up to mine. He rubs his nose against my own, and the smile that takes over his face makes my heart speed up. We're having a boy, he says. You're giving me a son. He places a soft kiss to my lips and briefly closes his eyes. When he opens them, they are so full of love and happiness. Making my dreams come true, princess making my life worth living. Love you so much, baby. I grab his head and push my face up to his and give him a kiss that I hope expresses my feelings. I love you, Axel. The rest of the appointment passes in a blur. Axel continues to hold my hand and shake with his excitement. He is itching to get out of this room so he can scream to the world that he is about to have a son. When we finish... The technician hands us some prints, and he scoops them up before I can even take them, thanking her while looking down through the images. 
he is like a kid with a new toy, completely enamored. I go up to pay and Axel steps outside, immediately jumping on the phone. Chances are the whole state will know when he is done that we are having a boy. I finish paying and turn around to find Greg standing behind me. Happy baby girl. More than you could even imagine. He smiles and throws his arm around me and gives me a quick hug. Axel turns, sees him and pauses in his conversation. Hands off, Cage. Greg laughs and drops his arm. Let's go. The gang is meeting us at Heavy's to celebrate my boy, he yells across the parking lot. The only thing I can think of is that I put that peacefulness in his tone, and together we are finally where we are meant to be. Epilogue Five months later I have been running around all day trying to make sure everything is in place for tonight. It's Izzy's birthday, and between anxiously waiting for our son to decide to come and dealing with the memories that still plague her around this day, it was turning out to be a nightmare. So far, the only highlight of today was seeing the blinding smile on her face when she woke up. Other than that, anything that could have gone wrong has. The caterer is late, the cake hasn't shown up, and the birthday girl will be here in an hour. I am officially losing my shit. This day has to be perfect. Dee took Izzy early this morning to spend the day at the salon next to the office. I avoid that place. I don't care how many times Izzy tells me that weird little man is harmless. I'm not buying it. The other day, he pinched my ass, which Izzy thought was hilarious. I couldn't even be mad about it when she was standing there laughing. Her large belly was bouncing with each breath. It was almost worth asking him to do it again if it got that kind of reaction from my girl. The last few months have flown by. We have spent every second getting the nursery ready and finally filling my house with more furniture than one person should ever own in one lifetime. It keeps a smile on her face, and it makes her happy. I would bend over backwards if it means that smile stays on her face. These last few days have been harder on her. Not only has she been dealing with an overdue baby, but the Georgia heat is making her miserable. We all do what we can to make things easier, but I can tell it is getting harder on her. Yesterday was a bad day. She spent the day in bed crying and wouldn't let me leave her side. She would say things about our angel baby missing out on his little brother. It killed me to hear her talk like that, but I would be lying if I said the thought hadn't crossed my mind, too. We have worked hard to overcome our loss, even going to therapy a few times to talk about things that were still painful. We are closer than ever, but that doesn't mean that things don't still sit heavy on our hearts. Yo, Reed, got the cake. That bitch at the bakery tried to tell me that you didn't tell her you needed it this afternoon. Got it, but damn, that shit wasn't pretty. Coop comes through the door with this stupid fucking cake I have been screaming at the bakery over for the last two days. Idiots. Dee just called. She said Sway was finally done rubbing all over Izzy's belly and has just started her hair. Should be another two hours now. Good news is we can figure out where those fucking caterers are, Greg says, coming into the kitchen from the deck. I'm about to pull my fucking hair out. It isn't even a big party. All the guys are coming, and last time I checked, even Maddox is bringing a date. Emmy has been here since Izzy left, helping me set up the streamers and balloons. Dee's current boy toy and newest piss-off Beck ploy is here helping also. I don't know him very well, but Izzy says that he is nice enough. I wish those two would stop their fucking games and just admit that they want to be together. I've talked to Beck a few times about it, but he would just change the subject and say that it wasn't his idea. I think I understand where D is coming from, but I am sick of playing monkey in the middle. Where's Locke? I ask. Doesn't matter who answers me at this point. He went to pick up Daisy, Emmy says softly next to my side. Or maybe it was Candy. She smirks and walks away. I shake my head, thinking, once again, it would be nice if someone stopped making me feel like I am stuck in the middle. 
Walking back into our living room, I push aside the balloons that seem to be floating in every direction and stand in front of the fireplace. Hanging dead center is the picture I gave Izzy for Christmas. Immediately, a sense of calm rushes through my body. I take a deep breath and remember what the point of this massive headache is. My girl. My girl and returning her birthday to a day of happiness and not one of heartbreak. With a new determination, I turn and walk back out to the porch, where we are finishing up with the decorations. There are pink and white balloons flying from every available banister. The path down to our dock is lined with torches, and there are lights streaming from the branches of the trees that line our yard. It looks like it is raining white lights. Emmy spent hours littering the yard with pink and red rose petals. Coop and Beck had a good laugh over the roses. Laugh all they want, but when they find their women, they will be pulling out all the stops to make sure that life is perfect, too. We set up tables across the yard and to the side for all the food. My backyard has been transformed into a princess's dream. I can't wait to see her face when she takes it all in. Greg, I snap, yelling into the house for him. Any word on those motherfuckers with the food? This is what I get for hiring out a big company to cook some fancy shit. Should have stuck with heavies. It is all she craves these days anyway. Fuck. Heavies. I cut him off before he can even open his mouth. Call those assholes and tell them since they couldn't show up on time to forget about it. Coop, get your ass in the truck and drive to heavies. Buy the place out. Everything you can think of and get it here. I throw my wallet at him and turn back to Greg's smiling face. What the fuck are you smiling at? He holds his hands up and walks off laughing. You need to calm down. I haven't heard you this uptight since last fall, Emmy says, sneaking up to my side again. I swear that chick floats. She is always popping up out of nowhere. I am calm. I'm not calm. I'm losing my fucking mind. My girl is sad, trying hard to keep it hidden, and I can't fix it. My son refuses to come out, and if one more thing goes wrong today, I'm going to say fuck it and kidnap my woman and drag her up to the bedroom. At least I know I can keep her happy there. You aren't calm, but you will be, she says before she vanishes again. I look around for her before I stomp back in the house and grab a beer. By the time Dee calls to tell us that they are leaving the salon... Things have finally calmed down. Coop gets back with so much food that it looks like he has, in fact, ordered everything Heavies has to offer. Locke has finally arrived and gotten the rest of the sound system running. Emmy is running around, making sure all the tables have flower arrangements and that all the bubble machines are still hidden from sight, but functioning. Coop is somewhere with his date, and Beck is bringing out all the coolers with drinks and dragging them down to the yard. You can't see the lights yet, but the torches are lit, and the rose petals against the green grass make it look like there is a blanket of pink and red. The balloons are rocking back and forth in the slight breeze. It is perfect. Nothing else could go wrong today. They're pulling up the driveway, I hear Greg yell through the house. We pulled all the cars behind the garage and down a little ways on the property. She won't see them from where she would park. If she comes through the garage, she won't notice the balloons invading the living room, either. Be right back, I say, handing my beer to Locke before walking into the house. I wipe my sweaty palms on my shorts and walk into the kitchen to get my girl. She comes walking out of the garage, looking like the angel I've always thought she was. She's wearing a long white dress that hugs her tits and large belly. It flows around the rest of her body, making it look like she is walking on air. Her skin is still glowing from all the time we spent down at the lake this summer. Sway did whatever it is that Sway does on her hair, and it is hanging long, thick with curls. You look beautiful. You don't look that bad yourself, baby, she says, walking into my arms and giving me a kiss. I can feel my son rolling against my stomach. Feeling okay, princess? I'm feeling great. Sway pampered me good. He even made one of the shampoo boys massage my feet. I bite back the displeasure I feel about another man with his hands on my woman. She needs today to be perfect, and my being a possessive ass won't help. Can Dee stay for dinner? 
I told her we were going to grill out, and she said she would love to spend some more time with me. Sure, baby. I give Dee a hug and start walking Izzy out to the deck. I hear her gasp from behind me when her eyes take in everything in front of her. Our friends all yell, Surprise! And I feel her jump through our joined hands. Her hand squeezes mine tightly, and I go to turn around. She looks shocked, but not about her surroundings. Um, Axel? I hear Dee call back from inside the house. She is standing behind Izzy and looking down at the ground with an odd expression across her face. Yeah? Oh, boy, she says, looking up to meet my eyes, and I note the apprehension. Izzy squeezes my hand harder this time and whispers my name. Axel? It comes out so light, I almost miss it. Shit, she must hate it. Baby? She tries again. I turn to look into her eyes and frown when I see sweat beginning to gather around her temples and worry lines across her forehead. Izzy, what's wrong? Holy shit, her water broke! I hear Greg yell from behind me. I look down and sure enough, there is a small puddle of water between her feet. Her handle on my hand hasn't lightened up, and I know that my girl is in pain. She gives a small, strained nod and waits a few seconds for the contraction to ease up before opening her eyes and looking into my own. He's coming, she whispers with a brilliant smile. Everything moves fast from there. I quickly usher her out to the car. We had stopped using the truck months ago when it became too uncomfortable for her to get in and out. D and Greg run to his truck and the rest of the gang files out. Emmy yells that she will stay behind, make sure everything is turned off, and meet us at the hospital. I don't care. Let the house burn down. My son is on his way. We make it to the hospital in good time, but by the time we arrive, Izzy is in more pain than before. Her contractions are coming quick, and she keeps screaming out in pain. It kills me to hear her hurting, and know there is nothing I can do about it. I start telling her how much I love her and try to reassure her with my words until she looks over at me with fire in her eyes and tells me to shut the fuck up. As soon as the words leave her mouth, she is apologizing. My poor girl. If I could do this for her, I would in a heartbeat. I pull up to the front of the hospital and, without even shutting off the car, sprint over to her side and carry her inside. Someone will move the car. If they don't, then they can tow it. There is no way I'm leaving my girl. They get us checked in and into a room quickly. Izzy is hooked up to a million different monitors and machines. I'm told that they all monitor her and our son, but I am too busy worrying about her to even pay attention to the nurses. They seem to think we have all the time in the world. Why isn't anyone doing something? Anything? We have been here for about an hour when she lets out the loudest tortured cry. The sound stops my heart, and I look around frantically for help. The nurses all spring into action and start shoving the bed around, turning on different machines and barking orders at me. I hold Izzy's hand and try to help her, but looking at her beautiful face breaking down in agony is almost too much. You're doing great, princess. He'll be here soon. She tries to give me a smile, but it's cut off when she lets out another scream. You're fully dilated, ma'am. Let's have a birthday. Izzy starts pushing at the doctor's commands, and I start slowly dying inside. My girl, I can't handle her being in this much pain. My mental distress for her continues, but I try to hide it and be the support she needs. I rub her forehead with the wet cloth one nurse thrust it into my hands. I curl my arm around her back and help her lean into her pushes, holding her leg open with my other arm. Thirty minutes later, at the end of a long push, I hear the most magical sound I have ever heard. My son is taking his first breath and letting out a loud, healthy cry. Would you like to cut the cord, Daddy? the doctor asks. I nod my head lamely and take the scissors. The nurses take him off to the side after I finish. I look down at Izzy and kiss her forehead. She meets my gaze and with tears in her eyes says, Hey, Daddy. That is all it takes for me to drop a few tears of my own. Thank you, Princess. You've made me the luckiest man in the universe. 
We both watch in awe as the nurses weigh and measure our son and bundle him up tight in a blue blanket. His head is covered with a tiny blue hat. They place him into Izzy's arms. Seeing her there with our son makes my skin break out in chills and my heart speeds up. Perfect, she whispers. I look down into her face and think that she is not wrong. He has a tiny, round, and chubby face. His lips are small and form a perfect bow. He makes little mewing sounds and puckers his lips, showing off a dimple in his right cheek. I lift the cap up and see a full head of jet black hair. He looks just like you, Axel. And he does. We sit there until the doctor is done cleaning her up and the nurses start leaving to go make another couple as happy as we are. This moment right here makes every day we were apart worth it. Complete. I feel complete. Leaning down, kissing my son softly on his small head, and breathing in his baby scent has me choking on my emotions again. We've been waiting on you, just as perfect as we knew you would be. Love you, little man. I kiss him once more before moving my lips to Izzy's. I kiss her twice before kissing away each tear that has escaped her eyes. Love you so much, princess. Watching Axel fall in love with his son is the most beautiful moment. I love you too, baby. So much. Axel has refused to leave our side to go tell everyone that the baby is here. We have just been moved into our private room and they start filing in. I'm impressed they made it that long. I'm starting to get tired, but the desire for our friends to meet our son keeps me from falling asleep. Oh, my lord! Look at him! He is perfect! Dee says with an excited whisper. Congratulations are thrown around, and we enjoy sharing this moment with our family. Each and every one of the most important people in our lives is here. I'm watching Axel hold our son close to his chest, and thinking that he looks like a little football in Axel's large arms, when I hear someone ask what his name is. Axel looks over at me with a smile and gives a small shake of his head. I look over and meet each one of our friends' faces when I announce, Nathaniel Gregory Reed. When I reach Greg's eyes, the tears gathering in the corner shock me for a second. He walks over and gives me a small kiss on the top of my head. Thank you, baby girl. That means the world. It means the world to me. I smile at him and wipe my eyes dry. Axel comes over and hands me Nate before climbing into the bed next to me. We all sit there and enjoy the moment, until the baby starts to cry. Axel looks worried, but I lean over and whisper in his ear that it's time to feed him. With some quick Maddox back and coop and reluctant D and Greg goodbyes, our family leaves, and Axel comes back over to me. He puts his arm around my shoulders and I lean into his body, saddling Nate so that Axel can look down into his angelic face with me. When I settle Nate on my breast and feel him give the first timid pull, I smile down at him and think to myself that fate finally loves me. Fate is welcoming me into her arms and shining her bright rays of love onto our family. It doesn't take me long to drift off to sleep, safe in Axel's embrace with the gift of our love in my arms. This concludes Axel by Harper Sloan. Narrated by Abby Creighton and Sean Christen. Copyright 2013 by E.S. Harper. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Harper Sloan and was produced in the year 2014 by Tantor Media Incorporated, which holds the copyright there too. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers, or call toll free 877 7 Tantor to request a catalog.